rules I use at my table today on Dungeon Craft. If you enjoy this content, why not take a moment to subscribe and hit the bell icon for notifications. Thank you. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about running a better game of D&D. And that means you need better rules. But before we get into that, I just want to thank everybody. We recently passed 10,000 subscribers. And as a thank you, we're going to be giving away a piece of Ultimate Dungeon Terrain. This one has 10,000 subscribed on it. And we're going to be having a contest to see who wins it and the details will come up later in this video. I read all your comments and they can be broken down into two camps. The first is very positive and encouraging, like Geek Out Studios who write, just discovered your channel, love the content, I wanna ask, do you play Dungeon Crawl Classics, 5e, Torchbearer, or a combination of all of them? A number of fans have told me to write up the rules as a PDF and they will buy them. The other camp are the people who say, you wanna change initiative, you wanna change magic, this isn't D&D anymore, don't call it D&D, you are a heretic. I'm going to be addressing both camps in this video. The compliments are very flattering, and I wish I could sell you the rules, but the truth is, my game is a Frankenstein-like hodgepodge of a bunch of different systems, which are over here, and I'm going to be calling them out, giving them shout-outs today, so you can buy them so the people that really deserve it can get the money. As for the charges of blasphemy, this is how I approach D&D. Competitive board games or war games from which D&D evolved they need hard, fast rules because you're competing against each other and the most important thing is that both sides have an even playing field with a clear idea of what the rules are. By contrast, D&D and role-playing games are a cooperative experience where the players and the Dungeon Master are working together to create a shared experience. Therefore, hard, fast rules that define every situation that might come up in the game are not really necessary. Next to me is a copy of the 5e Player's Handbook, but I don't use that much from it. I have it as a reference when people ask me questions about specific things in the game. But I don't even own a copy of the Dungeon Master's Guide or the Monster Manual, and I haven't bought them for several editions because I've discovered you don't need them. This is where I'm coming from as I approach the game. I think that uh, if I open a book and I see strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, charisma, constitution, armor class hit points, roll a d20 to do stuff, roll high, I am looking at D&D. It may not say that on the cover, but that's what it is. First edition, fifth edition, third edition, Dungeon Crawl Classics, Pathfinder, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, Labyrinth Lord, Index Card RPG, they're all Dungeons and Dragons to me. Same way Calvinists, Catholics, Quakers, Shakers, Baptists, Born Agains, Methodists, Mennonites, Mormons, Puritans, Presbyterians, and Pentecostals, are all Christian. There's slight deviations in the ritual, but it's all basically the same thing. We all roll a d20 and we all have to roll high. And several things that we have in the D&D rules as canon started out as house rules, like advantage, disadvantage, and inspiration. Rules like morale, alignment, and Thacko. Anyone remember Thacko? They were all canon, and now they're not. And that's because D&D is a living game. Like a living language, it's constantly changing. This book, the 5th edition Player's Handbook, these are not the rules. It's not written on a stone tablet given to us by Moses. It's created by Hasbro. Their job is to sell games and to keep make sure that that intellectual property, Dungeons & Dragons, is constantly in print. So they're constantly going to be revising it because when they do, they sell millions of copies of it. But the truth is you don't need that edition of the game to play the game. I taught my son how to play D&D when he was six, seven, and by the time he was eight or nine, he was running games for adults at Gen Con. At my table, you're not gonna hear a lot of game jargon. You're not gonna hear about skills, feats, attacks of opportunity. Instead, you're gonna hear natural language, like I sneak around the pillar, and shank the goblin from behind with my knife. You, you don't need to have read all those books. All you need is the basics of the basic set. You can run a game of Dungeons & Dragons really to almost unlimited levels. All right, let's get into these books and I'll show you how the sausage is made. This is the 1980 version of the game which came in a magenta box and I got it in Toys R Us. It was edited by Tom Moldvay. And although it's not as iconic or well-written as the Frank Menster 1983 red box with the Larry Elmore cover, it, it captures the innocence of the game like this creepy Errol Otis art the interior cover art of these adventurers fighting this dragon cooperatively, it really captures the spirit of the game for me. I don't know if I take any individual rule so much as the innocence. Here we have clerics, elves, dwarves, fighters, halflings, magic users, thieves. They were called thieves back then, not rogues. And you have these these couple of paragraphs of description, and that's all you need to know about them. The alignments are simple. Law, 
Chaos, Neutral. The only dual classes are Elves, who are both fighters and magic users. This is back when race and class were the same thing. Fighters cover everything from Conan the Barbarian to Robin Hood to D'Artagnan from the Three Musketeers. I still use this equipment list, and I can remember that a, a sword is ten gold pieces. I love the simple elegance of the character sheet, and, and I've always tried to capture that in my character sheets. This basic spell is with eight clerical spells, and just two dozen magic user or elf spells with these short descriptions. Shield, for example, has only two sentences. I, I'm always trying to capture the spirit of this edition. From 5e, I take the ability score modifiers. I like the idea that 12 to 13 is plus 1, 14 to 15 plus 2, 18 is plus 4. I take the armor classes. I cannot for the life of me figure out this advancement table. If you're going to redo the experience point table, why wouldn't you have experience points done in increments of 5 and 10, like 500 for first level and 1,000 for second level? This whole thing with 300, 900, 2700, that's weird to me. Races. My campaign is human-based, but if I have a younger player whose heart is set on being an elf, I will allow them to play it and I use these racial abilities. In part three, the rules of magic, I use the spells. Not this stuff. Just this. Some players want to know what they can do, and I say, choose a spell off here, and I'll tell you how it works when you cast it. I'll put a link to my magic video in the upper corner, but the way it works is... An apprentice wizard has to find a master wizard to teach them spells. Then they gain spells slowly and incrementally, whatever the master wizard, who is portrayed by me, the dungeon master, sees fit to give them. I tell the players the spell descriptions are how the spell works under optimal conditions, but individual casting experiences may vary. From Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, I take the punk rock attitude. I also take the old world as a campaign background. So the cities of Altdorf and Middenheim exist. I allow characters to look at the careers to get an idea for archetypes for their characters. So you're not just a fighter, you can be a protagonist, you could be a watchman, peasant or a rat catcher, pit fighter protagonist. I don't play with the skills, it's just ideas for types of characters that you might want to play. Similarly, from Dungeon Crawl Classics, I take a lot of the attitude. I love the inside cover artwork of like the worm eating this guy. As far as I'm concerned, this should be on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. You just know that these characters entering these caves are probably going to meet with ignominious deaths, and I love that. I love the character creation funnel, where each player makes three to four characters of zero level, and they get D4 hit points and a handful of copper pieces and a random occupation. You could be a barber or a butcher or a gong farmer, that's a farmer who farms shit, or an urchin with just a stick and two hit points. The first dungeon is always a meat grinder, and the characters who survive get to become first level. I love the spell system where you have to roll a d20 and hit a target number to cast a spell, just like anything else, and if you roll a 1, something terrible happens. Critical failure means your character gains a corruption point, and you slowly begin to devolve into something inhuman. The most recent influence, Index Card RPG by Hanker and Fernail over at Runehammer, used to be Drunkards and Dragons. This game is brilliant, and, and it started out as Hankerin's 5th uh, edition campaign. And these were sort of hacks to speed up play. I don't even use the index cards. I just use many of the ideas from the system. I think it's got a brilliant distance system. In a round, you can move from far to near. Or you can move from near to close and engage in combat. Or you can uh, just be in close and engage in combat. And you get to do one thing. There are no bonus actions, two attacks, so you can move it around the table more quickly. For those of you that hate my idea of getting rid of initiative altogether, this is the best initiative system alternative I've ever seen. So it's D20, group initiative. Players take turns clockwise around the dungeon master. So the person sitting closest to the dungeon master's left is the one that's going to go first. So typically you put the tanks first and the spellcasters and rogues in the middle and then the cleric at the end. And that makes it really easy for the dungeon master. People are actually selling physical initiative trackers, you know, like, you know, they're they're putting um, you know, magnets on their DM screen or using clothes pins to figure out where everybody goes first. I think that if you have to buy supplemental materials to keep track of who's going first, um, your initiative system is way too complex. Another brilliant uh, idea of Hankerids is the challenge rating. A themed room or area will all have the same target number. So, for example, let's say we're going to create a red dragon lair. The target number is 16. So to listen at the door and, and hear the dragon snoring is 16. Pick the lock, 16. Sneak up on the dragon without waking him up, 16. Save versus dragon breath, 16. Dragon's armor class is 16. Everything in the room is 16. And everyone always knows throughout the combat exactly what they need. The target number is also used when you want to cast spells. This is a complete list of cleric spells and magic user spells. This is it. 
it's just on a facing page. Detect evil, cure wounds, magic missile, fireball, shield, lightning bolt, all the classics are in here with very brief descriptions. To cast a spell, you need to roll the target number of a room. So if you have a room of goblins and the target number is 10, it's a lot easier to cast lightning bolt on them than it is on a dragon whose target number is 16. It speeds up the game tremendously. I cannot tell you how much. And that alone, not only is it worth the price of the book, and there are more things than this, hankering ought to be in charge of the 6th edition. This is a tremendously intuitively designed game. I, I, I can't recommend it enough. It's absolutely brilliant, and it's worth the price. I would order it today. Now let's give away some terrain. If you're following my campaign updates, they're the first Thursday of every month, you know that we're up to Cave C, which is the bandit lair. We did orcs last month, and the orcs have a relationship with the bandits of Cave C. Rolkin and the bandit leader used this secret room as a conference area, often trading contraband and playing a standing game of chess. Over the years, they've grown a mutual respect for one another's intellect and abilities. So what I want you to do is design a bandit leader. You're going to write a brief 100 word or less description, include statistics, and create a cool name. Put all the information below in the comments section, and the contest will be judged not by me, but my associate adhesive Tom, who is fair and impartial. The winners will be revealed in the next campaign update on the first Thursday of the month. The final game is Tracy Hickman's XDM, and I highly recommend this book. This is like seeing the Matrix. It's the basis for my video, The, Se the Secret That Every Dungeon Master Needs to Know, and The Second Secret Every Dungeon Master Needs to Know. If you don't know who Tracy Hickman is, he designed the Ravenloft module back in the 80s, which really changed D and D. The villain had this backstory, this complex backstory. So he's really like a like this tragic figure. Next to Arnstein and Gygax, I think Hickman has had the greatest impact of role playing games. That's undoubtedly why he is one of the only permanent Gen Con guests of honor. Tracy and Curtis Hickman's XDM, Extreme Dungeon Mastery, is less a set of rules and more a philosophy. Philosophy articulated in the chapter Getting Started as an XDM. An XDM makes an effort to make the game fun and exciting for everyone. An XDM tosses out the rules when they're in the way of a good time. An XDM tosses out the dice when they're in the way of a good time. An XDM tosses out the players when they're in the way of a good time. An XDM never caves into any rules lawyering, backs down from a call, reads aloud from the adventure description text, or refers to the rule book Ever. At a cursory glance, it, it looks like a parody, right? The tone is light, the, the artwork is cartoonish, it's got secret XDM rituals, it presents itself as a cult with a secret fake history. But then when you get deeper, it's got great sections on how to be a game master. The Campbellian monomyth, um, differentiating experience for different types of players, matrix plotting. And then you get into the system, which basically boils down to you tell the dungeon master what you want to do, and the dungeon master just tells you, okay, roll this on a 20-sided die. and that's pretty much the whole thing. Initiative is determined entirely by the XDM. Okay, it's your turn. You got five seconds. What are you doing? Swinging at the orcs? Okay, 14. You hit. Roll for damage. Now the orcs go. Now it's your turn. What are you doing? The dungeon master picks who goes when in the round. The one constant is everybody gets to do one thing. The entire magic system is this long. You simply tell the XDM what kind of spectacular magic spell you'd like to create. The XDM asks what level you are and what your modifier is and tells you the number you have to roll. If you succeed, you roll a d20 to determine the success. That's it. That's the entire spell system. At Gen Con, I ran a game for uh, little kids and their parents um, where the kids were the heroes and the parents are like their, their uh, henchmen and pack mules and stuff and uh, the kids get to boss them around and uh, one little girl in a princess dress is is playing a wizard and uh, I, I said what do you what kind of spell you want to cast and she says I, I want a rainbow sword I want to use it to chop off the goblins head so I said okay roll a 10 you got a rainbow sword everyone's cheering she's chopping off heads with a rainbow sword it's, it's great with little kids because you're not limiting their imagination by with these spell descriptions if you want to cast thermonuclear fireball you may do that at first level, the judge of is just going to say, well, uh, roll a natural 20. Gaining levels. Here's the thing. You can gain levels, but it doesn't get you any more hit points, and it doesn't get you any more skill points or proficiencies or feats. All it gets you is the ability to say to the XDM, I should be able to hit that orc easier because I'm fifth level. Hit points. In XDM, your character has something like 15 hit points. In index card RPG, you got exactly 10. Dungeon World, you have 16. This is something that all these games have in common. Limiting hit points. That way the characters never become invincible tanks. Hickman is writing from a designer's point of view. The more detail you add to the game, the more realistic you try to make it, the more options you give the player, the more the game slows down. This is a design truism whether you believe it or not. If you don't like 
Hickman, you can ask Mensner, Jonathan Tweet, Monty Cook, Adam Poots, Rob Davio. Any designer will tell you the more options you add, the longer a game takes. The more realistic a game is, the longer it takes. Armor class, for example, is extremely unrealistic. Armor, if it were realistic, it would make you not harder to hit, it would absorb damage. That's what happens in the game RuneQuest and Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. In those games, you roll to hit, then your opponent rolls to parry to see if they unhit your hit, then you calculate damage, subtract it from the armor, and subtract that result from the hit points. That's like five steps as opposed to the two in D&D. Is it more realistic? Yes but it takes more than twice as long to adjudicate. My campaign began actually 30 years ago as a Warhammer campaign, but as time went on I had more players and they had less time, I switched to D&D, because I could get that same grim world of Perilous Adventure by just capping everyone's hit points at 10. Also, Hickman points out there's only 20 numbers on this die. You can create a game system that tries to realistically compare Jiu-Jitsu to Taekwondo to Wing Chun and all their different damages against different armor classes, but it ultimately comes down to just one or two points on this die that aren't going to make a statistical difference. Just roll the die to see if you hit and move on with the game. Call of Cthulhu, for example, which is the same system as RuneQuest, has percentile dice. If you have an 80% library skill, that's the same as rolling five or better on this die. So once you understand this, you don't need a bunch of systems. All you need is this die and that XDM philosophy. Allow me to demonstrate. You are playing Commander Sulu of the Starship Enterprise. You want to lock phasers and fire on the Klingon Bird of Prey. Roll a 16, Mr. Sulu. You're James Bond skiing down the Swiss Alps being pursued by Spectre agents firing at you with submachine guns. You want to dodge all the fire and escape? Roll a 12007. You're Han Solo, Captain of the Millennium Falcon. You want to fly the Falcon into an asteroid field while being pursued by TIE fighters. Okay, I got it. Don't tell you the odds. Just roll high, Han Solo, and I'll tell you if you made it. You can XDM everything from cyberpunk to superheroes the same way. Just call a reasonable number out and have the player characters roll it. As to the earlier charges of heresy and the idea that I want to eliminate versatility and options for the players, let me respectfully disagree. Give you a quick example. You're in a tavern and a brawl breaks out and your character has no weapon. She left them all in a room. She reaches for a giant leg of mutton and tries to bludgeon a guy with it. Can she do it? Yeah, roll a 12. In strict 5e, she needs the tavern brawler feat or she can't do that. And if it's on the sheet but the player doesn't remember how it works, then you have to look up through the rule books, all of which slows down the game. I believe that every character has a right to be able to beat someone to death with a leg of mutton. Anyone can engage in diplomacy, you don't need a diplomacy feat. Anyone can swing a sword or pick a lock or attempt to read a scroll, they're just gonna need a higher target number on that 20-sided die. You still don't believe me about the versatility? Okay, you be the dungeon master, I wanna be a player in your game. So here's my character, his name is Giacomo Antonini, he's a human engineer, he's a master painter and sculptor, and he also designs war machines. He has a ceramic ball and he throws it and it bursts open and all these ball bearings roll everywhere and they can trip his opponents. He's got a double barrel crossbow. He's got another crossbow that shoots a grappling hook. He's got a spyglass that can see an infravision. What class is that in 5e? Where are the rules for that? Where are the skills, the proficiencies, the feats? Why are you eliminating my options? The idea that more rules gives you more options is just not true. XDM rejects the idea of formalized rules for every given situation and instead encourages the players and the DM to work out those rules for themselves, giving the players and DM unlimited versatility and options. Viewer Andrew Endon Frost reminded me of this quote by Gary Gygax. The one secret we should never tell game masters is they don't need any rules. You don't need to purchase rules for every single genre. That is what XDM is about. The main rule is that everybody has fun, and if everyone is having fun, and I'm fair, you know, people can die, but I have to be fair and consistent. If that's happening, those rules are perfectly legitimate. These aren't the definitive D&D rules. My rules aren't the definitive D&D rules. These are not the definitive D&D rules. The only definitive set of D&D rules are the ones you use at your table. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you hated the video, by all means, give it a thumbs down because it helps the algorithm anyway. If you have questions or comments, put them below. You want to accuse me of heresy, fine. Again, put them in the comments section below. Please share this video. The excuse me, Dad. Why are you here? Where's the swords? No one else is up here. Where's the swords? They're in school Why did for you Macbeth. Take them? We're doing Macbeth right now. We use the swords. Sorry. Please go downstairs and you don't can interrupt even again. You not consult me. I feel hurt. I feel betrayed. I don't even, I, I don't, how am I supposed to tell if you're even my real father anymore? This has been Professor Dungeon Master for Dungeon Craft. Thanks for watching. I'll see you at the table. May all your rolls be 20s. If you enjoyed today's content, click the Dungeon Door logo to subscribe to the channel and the bell icon to receive notifications. You can also join our Facebook group and follow us on Twitter at Dungeon Craft.